Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Purpose People podcast. Today, we're going to be meeting Caroline from Raising the Bar, and we're just going to talk about how through sheep building and team building, you can build exceptional teams. We're just going to find out a little bit about her history and her background and how she ended up doing such an interesting job. So, Caroline, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I'm interested to know how I build sheep, too. Oh, build sheep. Okay. <laughs> Sheep building. Yeah. Sheep building. Okay, so for me, you know, you do team building through sheep, which sounds crazy, hence why I got it messed up. But um tell us a little bit more about what that looks like. Oh, that's quite a big question, isn't it? Mm. Um <laughs> what it actually looks like is um a team of people who generally speaking are stuck behind screens in their offices, wherever they, whatever office looks like these days, yeah. in a field, yeah. working together to herd sheep into a pen. And that sounds really removed <laughs> from their day-to-day. -day. So that being so removed from their day-to-day, -day, how does that help the team? Well, I think the first thing is exactly what you've just said. They're in an environment that is completely and utterly alien yeah. to their everyday life. So that's one good thing. Yeah. And arguably, there are a zillion and one amazing team building activities out there where you could do exactly that and just be in a different environment. Tick that box. Yeah. Um, the, um, if you put in something like a pesky flock of sheep, mm. they're very unpredictable. And so yeah. they have no idea. And to be honest, we have no idea <laughs> how it's going to pan out. Right, okay. Yeah. I mean, we've got a bit of an idea because we've seen it a few times. However, there's no right way, there's no wrong way of doing it. It's about their way of working together. The team's way of getting the end result, which is getting the sheep into the pen. Mm -hmm. And that in itself, that in itself can be an analogy or a metaphor, if you like, for their day job. Now, yeah. whether that's about getting people through a shop door to buy things in the shop or whether that's about getting people past the end of a project management line if you like or whatever that might be yeah it's um that's what it's all about so and so obviously you know as you said you know what does the office look like we're working in you know remotely or we're working in office environments and being in the shop with, with with being in a field with sheep is just so different um do people get intimidated by seeing these sheep for the first time? Or? Uh, it's a mixture, to be honest. We have okay. those who are like just running out of there and can't wait to be, you know, almost cuddling the, <laughs> cuddling wow, the things. Okay, yeah. And then you get the odd one who might go, mm, I'm not so sure about this. And to be honest, quite often it's the ones who aren't so sure about it. By the end of it, they're the ones that want to cuddle the sheep. <laughs> and, uh, it, it, it's, it's lovely to see people um, transform, actually, in, uh, at many levels. But um. So talk us through a particular task. So they obviously turn up with you they've booked a team day with you but how does the day start how how does a typical day with you um they turn up on the farm quite often in fact i would say about 50 percent of the time the, the delegates don't like using the word delegates but the people the participants they sometimes don't know what they're even in for all they've been told by their oh, leader okay. is yeah right we're going to be on the farm for a day or we're just going to be outdoors for the day so yeah. they know what to wear what to wear um, but uh, so whether they do or whether they don't know what they do, they turn up at the farm, given a nice drink, welcome. The whole thing kicks off actually with a, a video, a piece of video okay. of um, professionals doing, some people might have heard of one man and his dog. It's, it's a, essentially the Olympics of, of sheep dog trialing. Is that still running now? Um, it runs through country file. Okay, now. got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so top level shepherds doing their thing with their dog herding sheep into a pen so that's effectively what they will see and that is narrated by whoever is the shepherd the head facilitator on the day yeah and then and then i guess then they just go ahead and yeah lead them to a field and say right let's do more or same. less I, i'm not going to give i don't want to give too much away absolutely. either absolutely no. i don't want to do any sort of spoilers here but essentially yeah <laughs> that's the plan <laughs> that, that's how it kicks off so how do you so obviously when when people come mm -hmm. uh the team come they obviously all got their positions and you know they've say there's a team leader let's say in your experience do you do you see those roles immediately play out or do you see 
a different hierarchical structure begin to form? Again, it depends on the team. Um, we've seen everything from the, the leader who really wants to take charge right from the start, and we've seen those where the leader, the actual leader, will actually completely step back and say, no, 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 guys, you know, I know as much as you do, or as little as you do, so yeah. we're all in the same, you know, as far as we're concerned at Raising the Bar, it's, a, it's generally a level playing field, and that's, again, one of the things we like about it, because it's, it's non-hierarchical, and yeah. so therefore actually people have to sort of find their way around it. Yeah. So, I mean, occasionally we'll have somebody that might have just by chance, you know, done a bit of a, you know, a, a gap year in, <laughs> in Australia and yeah, <laughs> helped out a sheep farm or, or something. Yeah. But I mean, most times, 90% of the time, nobody's had any experience of being up close and personal with sheep or even on a farm, full stop. You know, if you get very urban, you know, we get a lot of London-based companies, city-based companies, they've never really <laughs> been on a farm at all. No, and I think... They have that... to buy a pair of wellies, especially to come on the event. It's like, the first, this is my first pair of wellies I've ever owned, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And it, and I think for me, what we found is Claire, for instance, she did, um, she did a stint at, uh, I mean, it's a kids' club, an inner-city kids' club, and they'd never been to the sea ever and we took them for a couple of days to the seaside mm. they didn't know what a beach looked like they didn't know it was cold they had absolutely no clue and i think as you said if you're coming from say london which is you know very city very urban and whatever and now you're in a field with a whole load of sheep um that's quite, i think that's quite like a, intimidating in a way quite uncomfortable um and yeah i mean definitely something that they wouldn't have ever thought they'd be doing mm. so how how do companies decide this is the thing for them do you contact them or do they contact you are there many companies that do this sort of stuff it's a real mix actually um i'll sort of answer them in reverse really no yeah. there are no, <laughs> there's no one else doing exactly what we do right okay um there are there's experiences where you can go and walk with sheep or whatever, but that tends to be more for, um, you know, for birthday parties or something like that. It's yeah. really low key. Um, there's um, nobody doing exactly what we do. Um, so, uh, yeah, we can be found. I mean, people do sort of stumble across us on Google. I'm always interested to know. I'm always saying to them, you know, we say to people, so how did you find us? <laughs> and if it's not a, a referral, which quite often it is, of then um, it will be, oh, now what was I What was I Googling now? You know, and uh, some people have heard about herding. I mean, right now, to be honest, and um, <laughs> there's an opportunity because a lot of people have heard about herding ducks. That's quite, that's been around for a long time okay. as, a, as, a, as an activity, which can't happen right now here in November 2022 because of avian flu. So right, some yeah. people are Googling duck herding and it's because it's got herding in it. They're finding sheep herding and we come up very high on sheep herding, as you might imagine. So Yeah, because we, we, we're not too far away from the the, um, the Wetlands Trust yeah. down at Stinbridge. And they've got all the, mm. you know, you have to walk through a whole load of stuff and foam your shoes mm. and everything. Mm. So I didn't know that. Wow. Mm. So yeah it's a it's an opportunity but it's, i heard in, i never even heard that was a thing ducks it's yeah it's, it's a much shorter activity and it's it's, it's different it's very different to what we do but at the end of the day it's it's animals isn't it and if somebody's got a penchant for doing something with animals then it's that's it but uh, and but it really we also contact people i mean we're all over social media and as you might yeah. expect linkedin is our friend that's a, a big place for us um we do our own podcast for example so people find that um publish articles yeah so uh yeah, we and we contact people, good old-fashioned, you know. And what sort of organisations, we talked about London, but what sort of organisations have come through your doors that you've been able to help with this team building? Um, all, all manner um, of companies, All when I say all manner, I mean a whole load of industries, a whole load of sizes. However, our sort of sweet spot, if you like, um, the ones that come back again and again are the large multi-departmental organisations, generally quite household names i mean some okay. which some of which i'm not even allowed to mention sadly um oh, okay. but, can, can you mention but i can mention others yes i yeah, can i can i mean there's i mean nfu mutual nationwide yeah uh waitrose jp morgan it's, it's a real just some big, big clients, ikea big was a, a big break for us okay a while back yeah that was our lucky break actually ah, <laughs> tell us a little bit about the, the that then tell us a little <laughs> bit about ikea um it was, it's, yeah, it was because we, uh, the whole story is much longer than this, but essentially we were doing it before we were called Raising the Bar. So I'd 
thrown together a Facebook page and just called it Team Building with Sheep and put some pictures up and things because I thought, yeah. well, you know, people want to see their pictures. So I'd thrown together this page. Um, and then um, a, a farm uh, that runs, that primarily does weddings and school visits, but they also were looking into the sort of corporate market um, near Bristol. Yeah. They found the Facebook page. And at the same time, IKEA, who were one of their sort of regular conferencing clients, was okay. saying, well, look, what can we do this year for our team build? And they'd seen us, I guess, at the same time as uh, at the same time as they'd seen us. And they said, well, you know, there's this. And they'd ca- so they came to us and said, look, could we do your activity? We've got sheep. We've got the buildings. La, la, la. Can we do it? We've got somebody interested. We didn't know who it was at the time. Yeah. Um, but uh, they said they've got quite a few people, actually, but they're going to do it over a series of days. And we said, hmm, OK, no, sounds good to us. So we got talking with the farmer. And long story short, yeah, it was IKEA. And they sent their entire Bristol store, but in obviously teams yeah. so suddenly from doing <laughs> one event every now, every few months because it was really just a side hustle yeah. um, to uh doing five days worth of uh, teams with ikea was uh, a lucky break yeah to be amazing fair. amazing so obviously um you're one half of the raising the bar duo so chris is the other half um tell us a little bit about chris we're going to interview him but just tell us a little about chris where Chris's background is yeah I won't tell his entire story because I'm sure he will but essentially yeah I'm not from a shepherding background he is Um, and so that and it's actually I can't lay claim to the whole concept of team building with sheep it was entirely his so I'm sure you'll cover that in your interview with him (laughs) in a later episode (laughs) but yeah that's that so we were we're a family business that's how it started I'm I'm the marketing side of things so that was why I put together the Facebook page because assumed it would have legs yeah definitely so so how did you get into it then i mean obviously you've met chris and that's an outworking out but what what, tell us a little bit about your backstory from your career from like leaving school and did you ever think you'd end up in something like that at least events was that always on the radar or or what what was the plan when you left school what do you what do you want to do Mm, i was talking to somebody earlier about that today um no i well Clearly, I had no idea that I was ever going to be working. I was brought up in the countryside, but I had no, no I'm not from a, you know, Whereabouts? farming background, Where? Hampshire. Hampshire, okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, aside from that, no, my only, inter- I was a bit of a rebel schoolgirl. I wasn't actually very good at school. I was a bit naughty and um, just didn't really enjoy it. And uh, the only thing I did enjoy were languages. Um, okay. So languages was my thing, um, but because I wasn't wanting to get wanting or indeed could have with my grades gone on to do a degree at university I just had no interest I didn't want to be a teacher I didn't want to be an interpreter okay. so uh, I um yeah I just I just did a bilingual secretarial course because I thought well something to fall back on isn't it mm, what languages French and German okay yeah yeah and then uh then I did a placement in my secretarial course hated it so all right, that's it. <laughs> I don't want to be a secretary. I just knocked it on the head after two weeks. It's ridiculous, wow, isn't okay. it? <laughs> so started rummaging around uh, for other things. Just stumbled across prospectuses for colleges. Realised there was these these things called HNDs, and I thought, oh, yeah, yeah. much more those. vocational than degrees. They were quite a new thing then. Um, higher national diplomas, and uh, yeah, I found one that combined uh, languages with marketing and business and I thought well, that sounds a bit broader yeah that's a bit more interesting good. get into export marketing or something like that so yeah that's what I did at college so I did actually go on to um uni as it is now um and uh, did you yeah. to- did you top up with that with the HND because I remember I did I did uh I went through the full spectrum so I did the first diploma but I only did that because I wanted the work experience so at the end of the study I'd get a job first Someone gave me that inside tip and it actually worked. So when I come to the end of it, I was the first person in the college that actually got a job. And at the end of, so I did the first diploma and then I did national diploma, which was two years. And then I did the HNC, HND. Then I wanted to do a degree and I was told by the universities, don't do it. You're telling me not to, surely you want me here. And they said, there's no need. You've got a portfolio, you'll get a job. Try it. And if you do, stick with it. Um, And because... As you said, it was more vocational. I knew how an Apple Mac worked, which in university they weren't teaching people how to use. Mm. So naturally, it was an easier ask for me to go and work with them because I literally could start. Mm. I didn't have to wait six months to learn the computer or build a 12-foot paper mache tree or anything. (laughs) It was just get the job done. But I look back at the HND and that journey as 
a really positive experience because of that. And I think a lot of university courses have, although HNDs are around, all those talk of them changing or whatever, but I think that began to flip how degrees were structured, particularly in the creative industry, because there wasn't enough practicality mm. in, in a lot of the theory that were being taught. Mm -hmm. So for me, HND is a great thing. So did you did you have to do another year, another couple of years, or how did it work? No, mine was purely a two-year educational one. Uh, we did a, a, a term out in uh, France or Germany, depending which language you were studying. So uh, and in fact, I've just been back, literally, because it is a, a milestone anniversary of graduation right now. So we've, oh, wow. with five of my fellow uh, students, called yeah. friends, uh, yeah. we've just been back to Lyon, where we nice. studied. So, uh, yeah. So, so no, that was purely vocational. And, and then, it, weirdly, are you any of you doing it? Now? What the job that you train for? Um, <laughs> some of them are retired now. Oh, is, okay, <laughs> um, but no, quite a few. I mean, well, yes. I mean, and, and me included. I mean, I did. You know, I'm leaping forward, but I did then go on to use French and marketing. So I was, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was two or three of them actually. Yes, absolutely did. Nearly all did marketing, whether they all used their language, no, less yeah. less so. But uh, So you obviously do marketing then, so you obviously mm. finish, you graduate, whatever, then what was your first sort of marketing slash language job, or what does that look like? <laughs> um, well, to start with, it was just, uh, I always remember when I left college, because uh, I said I had my secretarial back, I had some secretarial skills, and I was in, based in Bristol, wanted to stay in Bristol, but actually it was at the time, I'm really showing my age here, but it was the time when things like Channel 4 was launching and Breakfast TV were launching, mm. um, and so, and I'd had some summer placement jobs in um, a radio station, also a TV station in Hampshire, so I knew that was my sort of bit of experience that I had, bit of work yeah. experience. So those two combined, I just decided, right, I'm going to work in the media. <laughs> so I just applied to all the radio stations and Channel Four and TVM, etc., um, which was great for interviewing. But of course, it was all up in London, so I thought I need to be up in London. So I moved to London and just did some secretarial freelance work, yeah. and. Um, and it was also at the time when I got really close to some jobs, uh, but I, I thought, no, this isn't, <laughs> it's, you know, it's quite narrow, that niche of launching radio stations, TV stations. So broadened out into more kind of agencies, marketing agencies, because yeah. I was getting the campaign mag that's probably still around. And yeah, seeing, campaign, see, marketing, yeah, 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 campaign. Yeah, yeah. So I, I could see that, um, this is in the 80s, I could see that there were um, the big thing was sales promotion agencies and they were breaking away from the big ad agencies and forming little sales promotion agencies. Yeah. So I thought, right, okay. So I got out my yellow paper and I wrote in purple ink <laughs> and attached my CV and I just sent them off in yellow envelopes to all these agencies just on spec, really. Um, got a few interviews, but this one particular place I went to, um, <laughs> I knew it had to be because I walked in and uh, it was a it was um, a converted wharf. It was all very trendy. Um, walked in and all I could see was a sea of yellow. There was a yellow sofa. There was a yellow sort of wicker fence. There was a yellow big parrot's cage hanging down from the ceiling. I thought, I think I'm supposed to be here. Yeah, yeah, so that was my first job. Yeah, oh, okay. it was an agency that was all donned out in yellow. <laughs> and, and, and then so you obviously then started to build a career around yeah. it and whatever else. Yeah. But you then... Change career, is yeah. that correct? Yeah, yeah. So, so how did you come to that decision? How did you come to that pivot? Ah, there's been two pivots, I guess, haven't there? Um, so I worked in agency world for about 15 years, um, and then and then I, I switched to the client side, and my sort of swan song, if you like, on the client side was actually working for the Millennium Dome. Okay. Um, so I headed up the whole sort of consumer promotion side of that. Nice. So my my role there was was quite broad to be fair and uh, i guess that in answer along to your question of a long time ago events that's my that was my f i mean i did a few events at the agency but nothing like i did at the dome i mean yeah. there were huge huge events with well the hugest being obviously the opening ceremony on new year's eve <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> millennium yeah. new year's eve yeah. so that was that was a fairly big gig not that it was all down to me but i had a big role to play so yeah, yeah. Okay. so that was that and so i mean i guess that's where the events bit came from and then um but then yeah I, that was a fixed term contract obviously and i thought i'm tired of all this i've had enough of all this i was turning another milestone birthday and i thought actually i want to do something different mm. but i didn't know what to be honest um and i just spoke to a few people i'd had some 
had some very late on careers advice actually and um, and that was purely out of a redundancy that I'd had just before that uh, Mm -hmm. fixed term contract which is interesting because of course redundancy can be a bad thing but it can also be a good thing because it opens up lots of avenues you might not have thought about and during that time I'd sort of investigated um, fitness training because I'd got into my fitness at that point late in life and uh when you say fitness was it is it running it was yeah it mainly running? but what, I became, marathons or ultimately marathons? ultimately yes yeah okay um but it was just that i was part of a running club and i'd come to it very late in life as in at school i was rubbish at sport and but i'd enjoyed running and what i found is that i really enjoyed if new people came into the club i enjoyed sort of coaching them if you like and teaching them to go from nothing to well, oh. It's now called Couch to 5K, isn't it? But essentially, that's what I was doing without knowing oh, it. Okay. Wow, <laughs> and, yeah. um, and enjoying that process. And I used to water ski a lot as well. And I always enjoyed it when people came along and they had no idea how to water ski. And I'd get them from floundering around the water to being upright. Yeah. So I just wow. knew I had this thing about helping people to go from A to B, if you like. And um, so that was where the. So I became a personal fitness trainer. I thought, right, I'm going off in a completely different direction wow. and just worked for myself. And. Um, because a really good piece of advice I was given is if you're going to work for yourself is be passionate about it and I thought at that point I wasn't really passionate about marketing anymore I'd had enough of it I was just I mean the dome was amazing but exhausting absolutely exhausting I'd reached sort of burnout I thought no I can't be doing that anymore yeah um so I just needed something different so I did that for about 10 years 10 years yeah. so, so the personal training you, you're doing you're enjoying <laughs> it you're equipping people so so you can see where you're starting to see where the links are (laughs) coming together to what you do now (laughs) so how i guess the next question is at what point did you raising the bar or that connection happen is it because you met chris and then you found out what chris did and yeah. Is that the journey? Is that the story? Kind of, because as a personal fitness trainer, it's yeah. it's hard work to build up your entire, you know, to replace my full time income is really really hard. Yeah. So I did something else alongside it, um, uh, which was involved with uh, the whole network marketing industry and a direct selling essentially of, yeah. and it was a health and nutrition company, which made all good sense. And it just so happens that. Um, Chris was also involved in this same company um, and okay. I, that's how I met him originally and he was subsidising the sheep farming world which wasn't going so well at the time. That's how we both got involved. So we both had second income streams through this company. That's how I met Chris and actually involved, you know, I, you know, without going into loads of detail about network marketing, but essentially you are helping other people. You're hel- Yes, of course, you're selling products, but actually fundamentally you're helping people, you're coaching those people, yeah. you're mentoring them to build their own business up in their own right. So I guess that's again where that journey of, you know, comes back to helping people from A to B, doesn't it? So mm. that's coming up again. And I actually did some coaching qualifications as well yeah. um, so that I could help them more. And so, yeah, that's, I guess that's where the sort of coaching and events starts to converge. Yeah, and, that's it. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. So, you, so you've got this thing where you're taking people, you're helping them, you're educating them. And essentially now you, you fast forward on with you and Chris and you start raising, raising the bar. What, you know, from a point of view of the impact that it can have in a team, what, what is the biggest sort of benefit for taking a team out of that, the everyday environment and putting them in the field? What, what, what is the, you know, what is the key benefit to that team? And do you see a difference? Do you get any feedback from having done it and then seeing what the next six months looks like? <laughs> yeah, again, it's, it's it's different for every team, but the, the the one thing that they all get is is just being out in the fresh air, giving them... They, they all just let go. They just let go of all the kind of stresses of their working life and possibly some bits of their personal lives too, they're yep. having fun, they're laughing, they are, as I say, all on a level sort of playing field. But because they're letting go, they are subconsciously taking on board these lessons which they don't know they're learning, if you know what I mean. Whereas if you sit people down in a classroom or in a training room, whatever, and teach them, it's sort of a bit, you know, it's a bit by rote, isn't it? And yeah. uh, whereas these are subconscious learnings, and I think that's what they get out of it, that's what they all get out of it. It's just that they're in that state they're in a they're in a subconscious learning state we call it playful learning it's our expression for it yeah, yeah. and there is actually a load of science that talks about you know um uh not playful learning but um yeah neuro well, play i think it's called yeah yeah but mm. you know you you're finding that even in young kids mm-hmm. they're now learning through play mm-hmm. obviously and there's psychological things that are being taught and they're mm-hmm. learning principles and stuff like that but yeah. i think as an adult we forget to play mm. 
we just can become normal business mm-hmm. people yeah. and we forget what it's like and that's what i love about what you do is because you bring them back to the core dynamic of just having fun but there's still a task at the end of it mm-hmm. and there's those relationships that I don't know if there's stuff bumbling under, they normally come to the fore mm. and, and the dynamics are changing. And, you know, I know like with our guys, you find superstars mm. that would never have really st- stood out or stepped up yeah. in, in, in that journey. Mm. So I think, you know, being in an alien environment does uncover, you know, unique situations and unique circumstances, mm-hmm. but celebrates people that are often not celebrated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know. definitely. And I think, so it can be used in that sense, you know, emerging talent is a, is a big area. And I know that, you know, companies, you know, the need to invest in their emerging talent because at the end of the day, they're their leaders of the future. And yeah. quite often um, clients who we have on a regular basis, it'll be their, you know, different cohort each year of their future leaders or whatever they want to call them. Yeah. And so it is absolutely, as you say, it's about spotting and nurturing the emerging leaders. Um, yeah. So that's, it's a really good feel for that. Uh, or you could sort of do it almost like an even further back, you know, when you're recruiting as an assessment centre to find out perhaps, you know, as part of a whole assessment process, see which ones you think might be uh, might be coming up, yeah, showing up as leaders or potential leaders. So yeah, there's, they... there's a lot of ways in which you can can use it. As I say, it's different for every client, but yeah. uh, that's that's one aspect they can use. And I think actually, again, coming back to your point about what's the one thing, I mean, right now what we're hearing so much about is the whole, um, you know, workplace wellness if you like it's a huge thing i mean we've always said we've always said that one of the great benefits is this release of happy hormones if you like just being outdoors and laughing mm-hmm. that's just even more important right now isn't it with people well, yeah having been getting people for the last yeah few having years. had the lockdown but then now we've got, you know settled into this sort of you know generally a fairly hybrid working environment by yeah. and large and so it's getting those people together face to face again and um you know but in a not like in a meeting room or in the office it's actually you know get them together but still so you've got the different environment and you're getting them together so you've got both you're ticking both boxes if you like but it's hugely beneficial yeah yeah so we talked about you know the podcast itself is called purpose people Mm. and do you feel that you are living purpose to an extent that you're helping people you're educating people is this what you thought you wanted to do <laughs> if you've just fallen into it and you're happy doing it what have it ha- yeah what would you say actually if i'm totally honest it was i mean clearly it was never anything i thought i'll be doing yeah um and even when we set out because it became about because it was an accidental business concept as opposed to one where we thought right what we need to be doing you know we didn't sort of find the marketplace and thought well we need a product to to meet that yeah. need. It yeah. wasn't that way around, as I'm sure you'll hear from your interview with Chris. Um, so it's kind of evolved. Um, mm. But what what has been lovely is that when you see the effect that it has on people, then that's a great result. There's nothing nothing better than when you're out there and you know out in, out in the field and you're seeing the transformation of people from when they arrive to when they finish. That's a really lovely thing to witness. And you think, God, I've you know, been a part. Of, I've had a part to play in that. And that's and the thing, that I, you, just even talking with you, that... Mm. That seems to be where you get your greatest joy is actually seeing that transformation. Mm -hmm, You know, whether it was the running Mm -hmm. or whether it's launching a huge event, you Mm -hmm. know, and everyone comes and experiences something that's, you know, Mm -hmm. unforgettable. Mm -hmm. It's it's that ability to celebrate and educate at the same time. And I think Mm -hmm. those those things are great. You know, you're seeing this transformational journey. And I think Mm -hmm. teams that teams a business either lives or dies by the strength of its team in Mm -hmm. a sense. Mm -hmm. So what funny stories have you got about this? Because there must be some crazy stories. What about raising the bar itself? Yeah, you know, <laughs> missing sheep. Oh, we've had a few escapes. <laughs> You've had a few escapes? Yeah, we've had okay. a, few, a few great escapes. What, the sheep yeah. or the people? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, the sheep, not the people. Yeah. Um, yeah, but to be honest, that's all That's all part of it, isn't it? It's like the unexpected, the unpredictable. That's all part of it. I mean, yeah. you know... I was about to use a rude word then. Things happen at work which you don't want to happen. And yeah. actually, it's another metaphor, isn't it? I mean, business is changing so much, so quickly. And I mean, again, take the pandemic. Nobody foresaw that coming, no. you know, or maybe one or two did in the science world. But no, really, you know, two weeks, two weeks time and suddenly the whole place has to stop working. Yeah. Yeah. So something as drastic as that, that is, you know in a small way sheep escapes out of the field so the whole exercise has to stop so then you have to think well what can we do as a team to either help 
the situation, help the shepherd? Do we go out and help the shepherd? Do we go there or do we just stand around and have a chat or what do we do? So it's actually interesting to see how they react to a crisis in the inverted commas. They might just think it's a laugh. Um, yeah. you know, and it actually depends on the situation. But yeah, we've had people slipping over in the mud and, you know, or sit making silly noises. Actually, one of the silliest things somebody did was when they um, just... A, just a tiny thing is that they decided that it was a good idea to find on their phone i mean they don't use their phones much in these things because we right. discourage it but okay. they had they got a sheep noise on they found a sheep noise okay and they decided to stand by the pen and just like, have this phone going <laughs> to see if it would attract the sheep and did it work no of course it didn't know didn't that. work gave them a laugh didn't it <laughs> yeah so i mean obviously and that's the key thing as you said it's this unpredictability with sheep um, having not met a sheep because I had COVID when my team went out, so I missed it. I was too weak at the time to go out there. But that unpredictability, I mean, you know, are there any tips that you could give away or is it strictly you can't share any tips for anyone? Mm. Would you? Could you give one tip? Probably not, actually. Okay. I'd probably rather not. No, rather because not. no, I think that it's that's you know that the secret is yeah the, the simplicity of of the exercise is that the task itself you know when we state what the goal is for the task uh, sorry when we no. state the goal of the exercise it's incredibly simple. Okay. It's very yeah. But so what, no, I would because every team is different as well. The way they go about it is very very different. As I said before, there's no right or wrong way. So behaviorally, with the sheep. Mm. What are they? What are they? Are they agitated? Are they scared easy? What What, what is the temperament of a sheep? And then what the temperament of a dog is? You know? <laughs> well, there are there are different breeds of sheep, and yeah. they're, as you probably know, and there can be slightly different temperaments of sheep. Therefore, okay. and occasionally we'll get some uh, a, a company saying. You don't have any particularly difficult sheep, do you? Is there such a thing? Oh, Thinking it? they're joking. And I go, yeah, well, yeah, actually, yes, there is. <laughs> so if you if you particularly want this, you know, uh, if you really, really want to challenge your tea, then, yeah, we can bring in the, a certain breed. Um, so, so a bit like, the, you know, you've got the regular army and you've got the SAS. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You bring yeah. them in. Yeah. You've got, you've you've got, got your SAS these. rogue heroes <laughs> of sheep world. Yeah, they're world. rogue heroes, yeah. <laughs> they're really difficult to manage, you know. So, I mean, for me, how would someone get in touch with you if they want to find out a little bit more about or literally get their team to do? How, how, would, they get, how would they get in touch with Caroline? Um, well, as I say, Raising the Bar, which is spelt B-A-A, as you might know, just search for Raising the Bar on all channels. We're on all channels pretty much. Um, and, um, yeah, that's how you'll find us. So through, on through the website, yeah. Through, or through the website, raisingthebar.com. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. you've got videos on there that you can Yeah, watch. we've got videos. Yeah, we've got a podcast, articles. So what's the sorts. podcast? Yes. How, how do I find the podcast? The podcast is called Sheep Dip. Okay. And we're on all the major platforms. So yeah. Sheep Dip was raising the bar. We'll find us. Yeah. yeah. Just just give some subjects. What would you talk about on Sheep Dip? What sort of thing? We've things? had several seasons. I mean, right okay. now we're towards the end of a season called the A to Z of team building. Oh, okay. So, what letter are you on? So we're up to letter um, S for sheep, as it oh, as there it happens. You go. Um, yeah. So we're we're just about you know it'll end by the end of this year, twenty twenty two. Yeah. Twenty two. The next season is going to be all about work- workplace wellness, actually. So uh, that's okay. the next season. Yeah. So we have a mixture. Sometimes we're with guests. So next season we'll be with guests. Yeah. Um, the current one is sort of internal, if you like. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've had days on the farm. We've had a, a, a real mix, actually. So, uh, yeah. Excellent. Well, <laughs> Caroline, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to understand a little bit about your background and how you've ended up into the situation of helping people. Um, for everybody out there, if you want to find out more about Raising the Bar, you can go to their website, uh, Raising the Bar, but double A. And, um, yeah, get in touch and find out more about how you can actually help your team. I will recommend it because my team went on it. They absolutely loved it. There were some pictures on our social feeds of sheep jumping out their arms and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, but it's one of those experiences that people haven't forgotten, you know, and that's, that for me, is the best thing about it is once you do it, you never forget it. So mm. That's what so we much. do here. We do hear that yeah. a lot. Thank Excellent. you so much. It's been a pleasure.